But all right, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Carly and we are coming at you from the Marine Environmental Education Center located in Hollywood Beach, Florida. Um, if you guys have been with us before, we've been running these webinar series for the last couple months, just highlighting different scientists and the research that they're doing. Um, so we are still closed. Uh, it's a little bit hard to social distance here, um, just because the meek is still uh, is so small. Um, so we are still providing these free webinar series. As always, they are recorded and then we will post them later to our YouTube channel in case you miss it or if you think someone you know would really love this presentation. Um, so that is it for me. Today we are going to be talking with Justin Bach. Um, he is a PhD candidate at uh, Stony Brook University on Long Island and he is studying horseshoe crab ecology, migration, and movement patterns using the power of sound. Um, he uses tagging data collected by citizen scientists to estimate survival rates and long-term movement throughout the U.S. East Coast to understand the effectiveness of fisheries management regulations. Um, so today he'll be teaching us all about horseshoe crabs and some of the cool work that he is doing up on Long Island. Um, if you guys have any questions, please type them in the chat. I'm going to keep an eye on it, but we will wait till the end of the presentation because chances are he might answer your question as we go along. So Justin, whenever you are ready, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, Carly, and it's a pleasure to be here um, presenting to you guys. Horseshoe crabs are such a cool animal in my mind, and Carly and I were just saying, you know, they're kind of like aliens on Earth, and I'll explain a little bit more um, why, why I think that. Um, so I'm going to structure my talk into kind of two different sections. The first half is going to be on the background of horseshoe crabs and just their importance in ecology and for human use. Um, and then uh, the next half is going to be going into my research, which is trying to understand their movements and habitat use um, throughout Long Island. So um, buckle up your seatbelts. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, uh, the reason why I uh, have the, the title of my slide is for tracking living fossils for horseshoe crabs is due to the fact that um, they are um, 450 million years old, um, older than dinosaurs, which is pretty cool. Um, but before I go into horseshoe crabs, I want to give you a little bit of background about me. Um, uh, I grew up in Michigan, which is not what you think of uh, uh, in terms of an ideal setting for marine biologists, but we had something close, which was the Great Lakes. Um, but I originally um, was fascinated by marine life when I um, went down to Florida on spring break um, to visit family every year. And I remember just becoming, you know, fascinated by the life in the intercoastal waterway um, and just, you know, playing around the tide pools in, in Florida. Um, and that inspired me to pursue a degree in um, zoology at Michigan State University. And I worked as a um, fisheries technician um, for my gap year in between finishing my bachelor's and then um, now, which is pursuing my PhD um, here at Stony Brook University, um, advised under Dr. Robert Serrato, who's a fisheries slash um, benthic animal ecologist. And the focus of my dissertation focuses on trying to understand movement patterns of horseshoe crabs to help um, identify areas for um, protection to, um, that are needed for their persistence, and also better understand um, how fisheries impacts their survival um, to um, help improve management decisions there. Um, so um, what are horseshoe crabs? I know a lot of you have probably seen them. You know, they're um, around um, the entire U.S. East Coast, all the way up from Maine down to Florida and even the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. But they um, are um, classified as marine benthic arthropods. They're older than dinosaurs, as I previously mentioned, which is pretty cool. Um, and they have survived an impressive amount of mass extinctions. Five mass extinctions is how many they've survived, which is very impressive. Um, you know, more than 90% of all species on Earth have been wiped out between all those mass extinctions. So they are you know, pretty sturdy beings um, for, for what they are. And um, there's actually four species of horseshoe crab worldwide. Um, three of them are distributed throughout Asia. So you can see here um, on the, um, in the west coast or east coast of Asia and Indonesia, you can see the, the three different species colored in orange and purple. Um, and then we only have one species here, Limulus polyphemus is a scientific name with American horseshoe crab and that, um, you can see the range in blue, which I just uh, mentioned. Um, and many people think that although their name it has crab in it, they're actually not true crabs. They're more closely related to um, spiders and scorpions than they are to other crabs or even lobster. Um, so that's why I, I dub them as imposter crabs. Um, so if you guys eat sushi with 
um, you know, the, the K or crab or the crab with a K, that's actually an imposter crab. It's actually Pollock. Um, so that's why I have this like little infographic of the imposter um, crab down there. But um, American horseshoe crabs um, are heavily well studied um, throughout their range. And something that's interesting about their classification is that they belong to the order of Cyphosura, which it, uh, means sword tails, um, which is pretty neat. Um, and horseshoe crabs um, uh, have a very complex life cycle. Um, they um, are laid on the um, beaches from spawning adults, typically every spring throughout the U.S. East Coast. In Florida, they actually mate twice a year in the fall and spring. So what happens is usually you have um, one female surrounded by one or more males each spring um, that um, they spawn from uh, typically April to June each year, and they spawn multiple times. Females can lay up to around 80,000 to 100,000 eggs each year. And what will happen is um, they form these intense spawning aggregations during the spring, usually have hundreds to thousands of crabs, depending on where you are on the U.S. East Coast. And um, you can have up to eight males spawn around one female um, in a nest, which is pretty impressive. Um, so um, once they, the eggs are laid, it takes about two to four weeks for eggs to hatch. Um, and once those um, larvae emerge from the eggs, they're actually suspended in the um, water column in local estuaries for about um, a month at most. And then what happens is they begin to settle down into the sand um, and they'll undergo their full, first molt. And they'll molt um, continuously up until age nine to 10 years old. Um, so they're, they're, uh, they have a late um, stage maturation cycle. They, um, it takes 10 years for them to mature, which is pretty impressive for any arthropod. You know, most insects mature within days on land. So they do have like a, a pretty long life cycle and they can survive up to 25 years old, which is again, pretty impressive. Um, and the reason why they're important um, to humans is that they um, have this unique um, compound in their, in their blue blood, which is referred to as limulus amoebicate lysate. And this compound derived from their blood is used to detect harmful bacteria that may be in medical supplies, such as shots. Um, for the diabetics out there, insulin strips are tested with their blood to make sure that they're sterile. Um, so we have a lot to owe horseshoe crabs in terms of um, saving thousands of human lives um, by preventing uh, medical contamination um, from bacteria, which is pretty cool. And you can actually see the um, reaction that their blood has on um, when it comes into contact with bacteria, it kind of thickens into jelly or like a fried egg, um, even outside of the body, which is pretty neat. And they're, they're the true um, blue bloods of the sea. They, instead of iron in their blood, like humans, they actually have copper as their primary oxygen carrier. So that's why you can see here in this top image, um, their blood is blue. And there are around four biomedical companies throughout the U.S. East Coast that harvest their blood each year. Um, roughly 500,000 crabs are um, bled each year on the U.S. East Coast. Um, and once their um, blood is extracted, it undergoes a series of processes to then transform them into um, uh, these vials collected here. And these vials are what's used as a, like a visual indicator to make sure um, vaccines and other medical supplies are not contaminated. So what will happen is they'll uh, mix fluid um, in these cylindrical vials down here um, and on the bottom um, picture. And if there is a infection, what will happen is that white compound will um, go through um, the reaction process with that liquid and there'll be a positive clotting. Um, which is a signal that that batch of, of medical supplies needs to be thrown away because it's contaminated. And if there's no clotting that's involved, then that means everything is good, there's no bacteria, and the medical um, supply is safe. Uh, and what's interesting is that um, I know many people have been asking me uh, questions regarding, you know, if they're already harvesting blood for vaccines, what is the impact of COVID going to have on um, horseshoe crab blood distribution and extraction? Well, it turns out there's a lot of um, hot press that's been coming out over recent weeks, like the New York Times has reported on it, Popular Mechanics has, has had their own slew of articles on it. And 
um, we won't know the impact of COVID-19 on the amount of blood harvested from horseshoe crabs throughout the world, probably until next year. But scientists are anticipating that there's going to be um, a 20 to 30 percent increase in, in harvest um, this year alone um, just because of the huge demand. I mean, we, you know, the, we need to um, vaccinate over 4 billion people on earth. So it's definitely going to um, have an impact on horseshoe crab blood. Um, although U.S. companies think that um, their um, blood harvest will not be more than previous years, although other international companies may need more just simply because horseshoe crabs do not live everywhere else in the world. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with them um, over the next few years. But they are, you know, this just goes to show how extremely important horseshoe crabs are again um, to help make sure that, you know, vaccines are safe for all of us during this pandemic. Um, and they also play ecological roles in the food web. So um, horseshoe crabs are considered dietary generalists, which means they're not really picky eaters. They'll eat a bunch of other um, benthic invertebrates, um, such as um, clam worms. Um, they even eat small um, bivalves, such as clams and mussels, and also other um, invertebrates, such as this isopod on the um, top right. Um, and they're classified as bioturbators, which um, for those of you that don't know, bioturbators are um, a class of organisms that um, can directly or indirectly alter the ecosystem around them. So either horseshoe crabs can change the biodiversity or species um, richness in the area by directly feeding on those animals in the sediment, or they can, but just by their physical bearing behavior as pictured on the bottom right, they can um, change the structure of the habitats for other organisms and can um, also indirectly affect the um, population abundance of, of invertebrates there. Um, and in some estuaries, horseshoe crabs are um, considered keystone species, which uh, means that these species um, are important for maintaining balance between um, different links in the food web within their respective ecosystems. And this diagram on the left-hand side, um, you can see horseshoe crab and eggs in the center of the food web, just showing you again their importance for um, controlling the lower um, part of the food web for like algae, mussels, and clams, aquatic worms. So they help regulate that population, but they're also an important food source to many other organisms such as fish, um, some shrimp, shorebirds um, in particular, heavily rely on horseshoe crab eggs um, for food. But again, this just emphasizes, you know, how important they are for maintaining balance in their local food webs. Um, and What's um, particularly interesting about their importance in food is that many migratory shorebirds rely on horseshoe crab eggs for um, fueling their migration and reproduction patterns. And this includes the um, endangered red knot, which is pictured on the bottom left, and this orange bright vibrant bird. These birds undergo astonishing um, migratory patterns each year. They, they literally uh, migrate from the South Pole to the North Pole in a matter of three months. And Delaware Bay is actually an important stopover for these red knots because they um, will come about mid-May when horseshoe crabs are spawning on the beaches and will um, increase their body mass, you know, fourfold by feeding on horseshoe crab eggs in a matter of weeks. So this um, is important. Uh, you know, horseshoe crab eggs are just very important for providing energy to a, a whole slew of, of animals. Um, on the top left picture, there are a lot of, um, this is just showing you um, the amount of eggs that can be um, washed away from the tide. So all the, those green little specks in this top left photo here just show you how dense these eggs can be. Um, this is actually taken, was actually taken in Delaware Bay two years ago. Um, and then the right-hand side, these are a bunch of laughing gulls that are feeding on um, the different nests where the horseshoe crab eggs have been laid. So they're, the, again, just relaying how important the uh, horseshoe crab eggs are for shorebird feeding. And other fish such as striped bass who eat their eggs and even crocodile, I mean, even alligators down in uh, Florida have been known to eat um, horseshoe crabs um, in their adult stages, which is um, pretty insane. Um, and horseshoe crabs are also important for the commercial bait industry. Um, so up until um, the mid-1900s, horseshoe crabs were actually um, used for fertilizer. Um, so this bottom left picture here is showing you the amount of horseshoe crabs harvested each year um, in Delaware Bay. It was 
it's astronomical. There was over tens of millions of crabs harvested just for the purpose of fertilizer. Um, and once other fertilizers became manufactured um, from chemical plants, um, there wasn't as much a demand for horseshoe crabs for fertilizer, but the demand switched because they um, were good attractants for whelk and eel. So a lot of bait fishermen will capture horseshoe crabs um, along the U.S. East Coast, um, section them into quarters, and put them in bait bags or traps um, to attract whelk and eel. Um, so whelk are, are these um, mollusks, you know, they're very similar to conch, which you may see in Florida. Um, this is a picture of a channeled whelk in the bottom right, and then on the top right picture is the um, eels, um, that are caught as well with horseshoe crabs as bait. And um, up until um, 2000, the um, economic value of horseshoe crabs coastwide was 14 million US dollars. Um, and today it's still a relatively lucrative fishery at three to $8 million. So it's a multi-million dollar fishery and roughly 2 million um, horseshoe crabs are harvested each year on the coast um, through this, this industry alone. So you, not only do you have the biomedical harvests, but you also have um, bait harvest as well. So there a multi, um, there's multifaceted purposes of horseshoe crabs um, for human um, health and economic purposes. And the current status of horseshoe crabs um, is doing better than back in the 1900s, although it's still relatively poor um, in many areas throughout the U.S. East Coast. Um, currently, um, horseshoe crabs are managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and they're kind of managed into four separate zones as colored here on the left-hand map. So there's um, four different regions in which they're managed. You have New England, New York in purple, Delaware Bay in blue, and the southeast in orange, uh, orange-yellow. And um, each of these regions have different management regulations to um, help ensure that horseshoe crabs are sustainable um, and they will change their um, regulatory actions based on um, different surveys to see how horseshoe crabs are doing. And um, prior to the, you know, 2000, there was very little regulation on horseshoe crabs um, and until um, horseshoe crab abundance started to decline, um, in the um, 1990s, there was um, very little interest in trying to manage the species. And in fact, a lot of um, shorebird conservationists lobbied for horseshoe crab conservation in the 19, um, 1990s because shorebirds were in fact declining due to horseshoe crab decline. So there was this um, kind of multi-conservatory group that was pushing for horseshoe crabs to be managed, um, which, and now um, they're one of the most um, heavily managed species of invertebrates on the U.S. East Coast. Um, and this graph here is just showing you, you know, how the um, commercial landings for the bait industry has changed since 1998, all the way up to 2016, which is the most recent available data. Um, and the y-axis here is showing you the, how many millions of crabs have been harvested in each respective region on the U.S. East Coast. And in 1999, there was, a, you know, over 2 million crabs harvested. Um, and the management efforts seem to um, help improve and lower the commercial ant landings. As you, can, as you can see, now going up to 2016, you know, maybe a million or so crabs are harvested. So almost 50% reduction in a matter of 20 years in terms of harvest there. However, um, there are still um, some concerns in different regions of horseshoe crab viability. And I don't know, um, some of you may have heard of uh, marine protected areas to help conserve a variety of species. Um, and there are um, plenty of marine protected areas for horseshoe crabs throughout the U.S. East Coast that ban uh, um, horseshoe crab harvest for any reason, including biomedical. Um, so this map here on the left-hand side shows you some marine protected areas um, in the greater New York City area. Um, so uh, Manhattan is, is just up the, in the upper part of this map. You can see in um, different coastal estuaries here, uh, part of the Gateway Na National Recreation Area, horseshoe crab harvest is banned. Um, in New Jersey, the entire state actually bans horseshoe crab harvest. And then in the mouth of Delaware Bay, there's this um, horseshoe crab reserve where it's legal to capture horseshoe crabs from any fishery, um, including trawling fisheries through any nets or any sort of hand fishery. So um, there are some protections for horseshoe crabs, and some of these have been um, proven to be effective over recent years in terms of improving um, their numbers. However, um, 
despite these regulations, horseshoe crabs in the U.S. are still considered to be um, vulnerable and decreasing according to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is an international um, conservation body comprised of scientists from all around the world that assess the status of species. Um, so it's becoming still important to understand more about horseshoe crab population dynamics and movement to help improve um, different regulatory measures and help um, bolster their populations. So um, why is understanding the movement important? Um, well, as I just mentioned here, there are um, marine protected areas and unprotected areas where horseshoe crabs are allowed to be harvested. Um, so one of the reasons why it's important to understand horseshoe crab movement is, um, you know, it's impossible for managers to close the entire coastline to protect animals. That would greatly, you know, impact adversely impact um, fishermen, the economy, et cetera. So we have to be more strategic in terms of defining areas that are important for protection um, for certain species. So understanding the movement will help um, improve the effectiveness of some protected areas. Um, and we also want to better understand um, what type of habitats horseshoe crabs rely on um, for their, their food use, for spawning, um, just all around um, different habitats they need throughout their life cycle to help um, just identify important habitats that are needed for their persistence. So that, those are two reasons why we may want to understand movement. Um, another reason is that there is a whole slew of um, environmental factors that can affect animal movement, such as um, temperature, um, seasonal daylight can impact uh, migratory movement of, of animals as well as currents and even um, lunar cycles can have an impact on animal movement. So um, we also want to try to understand um, what, uh, which of these environmental factors or how many impact um, the movement of horseshoe crabs because if we can identify the, the windows at which they migrate under these different um, environmental characteristics, we can help seasonally um, protect them but um, uh, more efficiently um, throughout their range. So this is just a map here showing you um, on the top um, left, showing you temperature changes um, around the world as well as um, day length changes. This is actually showing you the amount of chlorophyll on the right hand side, um, just in terms of seasonal variation. Um, and um, it's been thought that horseshoe crabs uh, primarily rely on both temperature and photo period or, or day length. Um, in terms of um, triggering their movement patterns. So um, we wanted to investigate, you know, the impacts of temperature and, and day length on um, understanding their movements. Another research question um, that we wanted to investigate was um, how many crabs migrate between estuaries in the ocean each year? Because it turns out that um, between New England and the Mid-Atlantic, there are um, differences in movement patterns in horseshoe crabs um, so, for instance, in New England, a lot of um, horseshoe crabs never migrate into the ocean. They were mainly stick in the estuaries, whereas in the Mid-Atlantic, um, in Delaware Bay and Chesapeake Bay, and even in Florida, um, they're observed to exhibit this movement pattern known as partial migration, um, which is where a small minority of individuals may migrate between the ocean and the estuary each year, whereas the majority of individuals may just remain in the estuary as residents each year. Um, and this is important because, um, you know, if, if these animals have different movement patterns throughout their range, a certain management plan or marine protected area may not be as effective given their differences in, in movement patterns. So it's important to um, just identify which type of, of movement um, horseshoe crabs exhibit. And just to emphasize this pattern, I, uh, on the upper um, circle here, this is just showing you horseshoe crabs fully remaining resident, staying in one habitat or water body throughout their entire um, life cycle. Whereas the phenomenon of partial migration here is showing you um, the movement between two different locations. Um, and you know, you this is just showing you the, the green crabs are the ones that are migratory and the brown crabs are the ones that are remaining resident. So this is just, again, a visual aspect showing you um, the differences in movement patterns. And um, despite how much research has been going th um, into American horseshoe crabs, uh, we, there's still a lot to know about 
um, how horseshoe crabs use different habitats across different life history stages. Um, so what we know is that um, within the first few years of life, juveniles primarily remain in intertidal areas up until around age three to four. Um, and um, once they grow to this um, larger juvenile stage, um, after about four years of age, they end up um, migrating into deeper waters and within their estuaries, um, within their local estuaries. And we still don't know what habitats they rely on in those um, subtitle or deeper habitats um, in this age group. Uh, but then obviously we know a lot more about um, adults because they, um, once they become sexually mature, they will end up um, migrating seasonally back between their spawning beaches in the inter intertidal zone, as well as the estuaries or ocean. And, and there's been far more um, work on movement and understanding adult movement patterns. Um, and this is just showing you the animation of, of horseshoe crab movement through age. Um, as I mentioned, um, this is just again emphasizing how um, this is a, 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 from a study showing you the distribution of juveniles based on their sizes. Um, and we measure them, um, their size based on prosoma width, which is the maximum width in their carapace. And um, again, this graph is just showing you how little information we've had on, on their distribution in those um, larger juveniles, such as those that are larger than 85 millimeters in prosoma width. So their movement larger remains elusive, and it's important to identify their movement patterns to um, identify nursery habitats that these juveniles rely on to persist and grow into adults. So um, how does one track horseshoe crabs? Well, we use this um, unique technology that uses the power of sound to track horseshoe crabs, um, as well as other marine animals. Um, this technique is called acoustic telemetry, which relies on um, two different pieces of equipment um, for you to track an animal. One piece of equipment is an acoustic receiver, which is this black cylindrical device pictured on the um, bottom right two figures that's usually attached to a screw anchor or a rope. And these transmitters will listen for um, um, signals emitted from these smaller cylindrical devices, such as acoustic transmitters, um, which send these transmitters send um, several unique acoustic. Um, pings at a certain frequency underwater, and each series of pings is unique to each animal. So we can um, easily identify which animal was detected at a certain point in time when they're within about uh, 900 feet of these receivers underwater. And the bottom left here, this is showing you a, um, a horseshoe crab tag with an acoustic transmitter. Um, so we actually um, glue the acoustic transmitter on like a Velcro backpack on the back of um, the horseshoe crab shell. And um, these batteries can um, last for about three to four years. So we can track an individual for three to four years um, with this technology, which is pretty neat. Um, and we, um, throughout uh, my dissertation, we've tagged um, 100 um, adult horseshoe crabs and 25 juvenile horseshoe crabs to better understand their movement characteristics. So um, we actually deployed um, a lot of this acoustic telemetry equipment in a estuarine embayment known as Murch's Bay on the south shore of Long Island, New York. So this uh, um, map here um, to the left shows you where our water body is in relative um, location to New York City, which is this big apple here. Um, and on the, um, this is a satellite image on the right-hand side showing you uh, Murch's Bay. And Murch's Bay um, is very similar to the intracoastal down in Florida, um, which you guys are familiar with. Um, there's a whole variety of different habitats, such as seagrass, mussel beds, um, sand and mud flats, and a lot of salt marsh vegetation as well throughout the um, ecosystem. So it's a, a very diverse bay in terms of habitat. Um, so we felt like it was a good area to kind of understand horseshoe crab movement and, and spatial um, use. Um, throughout my dissertation. Um, and, oh, hold on, I'm frozen here. Um, and this map here shows you um, where our um, receivers were located. These blue dots here represent our acoustic receivers. Um, and these, um, so we have over 20 acoustic receivers deployed throughout the bay up from May all the way up to November each year. And we did this study for three years from 2017 to 2019. 
Um, these receivers were actually attached either to screw anchor moorings, as shown on the bottom image, the bottom center image, or attached to Coast Guard navigational buoys. And um, we tagged adults and juveniles across a variety of locations throughout the bay. So adults were um, locations were are denoted by the orange star, whereas the white stars denote juvenile release locations throughout the bay. And what we found was that um, our population, very similar to mid-Atlantic um, horseshoe crab populations, ended up um, exhibiting that partial migration pattern. So 22 out of um, 64 adults tagged ended up migrating from July to November from the Bay out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and what we found was that um, some animals actually returned in 2018 um, back into the Bay during the spring to spawn. So we found that 12 um, adults returned from April to June. Um, and in 2018, we noted that one um, male actually migrated to Great South Bay, um, the adjacent bay that, that Merch's Bay is connected to, which is pretty neat. So this is showing you that, you know, we do have um, partial migration. Um, about one third of horseshoe crabs ended up exhibiting migration um, from the bay to the ocean. Um, whereas the majority of individuals only remain within Merch's Bay throughout the entirety of the study. Um, and again, we also had some um, returns in 2019 as well. And for juveniles, um, we actually found out for the first time that um, these juveniles um, do actually migrate, although at a much lower rate. We have about 10% of juveniles migrate between the bay and the ocean. Um, however, we didn't see any of these juveniles actually return from the ocean to the bay um, in any of the subsequent years, which may have suggested that they uh, migrated out into the bay to um, molt into adulthood. Um, and when that happens, we don't, um, it's impossible to retrieve that tag because it's attached to the shell. So if they molt, then we can't um, physically track them anymore um, as a result. And what was interesting is that we found that migration um, tended to depend on a variety of different um, external um, influences, environmental influences. Um, so th this graph here is a rose plot. Um, each of these um, wedges um, shows you how many crabs migrated across different moon cycles. So up on the top, we have the new moon cycle. To the right, we have the first um, quarter moon. Then we have a full moon and then third quarter moon on the left. And what we noted was that um, migration um, was preferred um, during the new moon cycles, which is interesting because that's when um, the tide is the highest um, due to the gravitational pull of the moon. So um, this, this suggests that um, within the spawning season, that migration may depend on um, the, when the tides are the highest of the highs in each month based on the moon cycle. And we also found that um, temperature, the migration probability depended on um, temperature differently across different seasons. So on the x-axis here, we have temperature in degrees Celsius. And on the y-axis, we have migration probability from zero to 100% each year. And each of these colors um, represents different years and seasons of migration. So the red line um, represents the fall 2017 migration from the bay to the continental shelf in the ocean. Whereas in the spring, of 2018 and 19 represented by green and blue shows you the immigration um, from the ocean back into the bay. Um, and what's interesting is that um, horseshoe crabs in the fall tended to migrate from a temperature range of 22 um, degrees Celsius all the way down to 11 degrees. So that's about a, a 25 degree Fahrenheit difference in terms of when horseshoe crabs migrated. Whereas conversely in the spring seasons, there was a much narrower temperature window at which horseshoe crabs uh, migrated back into the bay. Um, most crabs actually uh, migrated um, at temperatures less than 16 degrees Celsius um, and their temperature range ranged from eight to nine. So the temperature range of migration in the spring was half that in the fall. Um, which is interesting, and we still don't know why, why that is. So that remains to be an answer um, to address in future studies. Um, but what's interesting is other studies thought that horseshoe crabs kind of became inert and didn't move below 10 degrees Celsius, but our results showed that 
um, two crabs here, um, this green stuff migrated at temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius, suggesting um, they can migrate at cold temperatures. And um, we also found that migration differs between um, the fall and spring in terms of the range of, of daylight, in terms of hours. So um, this is, photo period or daylight is on the x-axis and probability of migration is on the y. And what we found was that um, in the spring, um, similar to temperature range, the spring migration back into the bay, um, horseshoe crabs migrated at much narrower windows, only a difference of of 12 and a half to 14 and a half hours in daylight. But um, again, when they're migrating out into the shelf, they're kind of migrating at a slower rate from the bay to the um, ocean um, during the fall. And um, the temperature range here was twice as, or the photo period range was twice as high um, as relative to the spring. And um, these are maps showing you um, how many um, different connections between different habitat locations, both adult males highlighted in red and adult females highlighted in blue, made across um, different seasons throughout the 2018 year. Um, and each of these, um, these circles um, are graduated by size to represent which habitats um, had more unique connections made by animal or made by horseshoe crab movement in each year. Um, but um, one of the main takeaways I want you to take away from here is what was interesting is that in the spring season, the upper, um, the top two upper um, plots on the left and right, both males and females move the most um, throughout nearly all habitats in Murch's Bay um, in the spring. You know, almost all habitats were occupied. But then as you progress down into the summer and fall, you start to notice their movement isn't as dispersed. They start to become more restricted in movement and move much less in the summer and fall. Um, and this may be due to two reasons. One is that we think in the spring, um, this is during their spawning season, so they may be more likely to try to find habitats needed for spawning. Um, and they also may be um, needing to stock up on food because um, reproduction is really expensive energetically. So they may need to find more habitats um, for food as well. Whereas um, in the fall, we think that um, their movement isn't as, as widespread because temperatures typically decline, which slows their metabolic rate because they're cold blooded. Um, we also think that um, less animals are detected in the fall because they're migrating out into the ocean. Um, so this is just showing you this, you know, the complexity of, of horseshoe crab movements across season. Um, and I have a um, animation on the next slide that shows you each individual being um, tracked um, from the fall all the way up to, um, or the spring all the way up to fall in 2018. Um, so this is starting out in April. Um, here you can see um, the crabs are starting to migrate from the ocean back into the bay and they're making relatively fast movements. Um, these movements occur over a matter of a few days. Um, so you can see each of these individuals highlighted in different colors migrating to all locations throughout the bay um, in the spring. So we're still in, in June here according to this timestamp. Um, some animals are staying put, um, others are moving. Um, and as you head into the summer, um, you start to see some crabs slowly heading towards the center of the bay and onto the inlet. Um, but this is just a neat way of, of showing animal movement and how um, dispersive and, and how far horseshoe crabs can actually move. A lot of people don't think they can move that far um, within a given year. And this is just showing you the, the adult movement patterns. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. And now we're already in, in September. So you can see their movements are starting to um, slow down a bit, or they're slowly moving out to the bay in the fall, out of the bay in the fall into the ocean. Um, but they're not moving to the eastern or western habitats as much um, at all. And then for juveniles, we found that um, juvenile horseshoe crabs move a lot less. So the inlet um, is down in the center of the um, bottom of the plot. Um, but juveniles move at a much slower and smaller scale relative to the adults. Um, as you can see here, each of these individuals are kind of mainly staying put, 
you have a few individuals moving back and forth between habitats, but they're really not um, moving out into the inlet as much, um, out into the ocean. Um, they're primarily staying put and move much slower, which makes sense because they're smaller um, as well. But um, this could have implications for management because this is suggesting juveniles rely on a smaller area of habitat. And if there's other physical disturbances, such as like um, dredging or fishing, this could um, adversely impact juveniles more so than adults because, you know, juveniles may rely on a smaller area for food and um, space use um, and other factors as well. And this next plot here is just showing you um, the differences between adults and juveniles in terms of um, their probability of remaining um, as residents in different habitats throughout the bay. So um, adults here highlighted in purple on the top occupy more habitats routes to juveniles, which is what we just saw in those last animations. Um, adults um, tended to have less than 10% chance of staying in any habitat throughout this period. Whereas juveniles had a higher chance of remaining in a small amount of habitat locations throughout um, this period. Again, suggesting that juveniles don't move as much relative to adults. They tend to be more restricted in terms of um, their movement patterns. Um, but this map just, again, shows you like a snapshot in, in the spring period of, of which habitats both adults and juveniles rely on throughout the day. And before um, I wrap up on this movement, I want to just mention that um, there's been a lot of um, horseshoe crabs, or a lot, a lot of um, research in animal movement um, suggesting animals have personalities. And I like this quote from Walt Disney, where he quotes that animals have personalities like people and must be studied. And um, over recent years with more sophisticated movement technology coming out, um, ecologists are beginning to think that animals do in fact have personalities uh, because we know that individuals um, do not behave the same year in and year out in terms of which habitats they use. So this next slide here um, shows you across um, different years, three different individuals in each column. Um, and shows you how they each have their own kind of different preferences um, between years in terms of habitats used. So um, this is just like a, um, showing you the different habitats dis distributed throughout the bay. Um, the top row represents 2017, the middle represents 2018, and the bottom is 2019. And you can see here individuals do not um, behave the same way each year, which is um, pretty neat. You start to see some individuals migrate a lot more, use more habitats in certain years versus others. Um, and this is just going to show that, you know, individuals do have different personalities and preferences, um, kind of like humans um, across, you know, different um, scenarios. And be um, before I conclude my talk, I just want to mention um, that we need citizen scientists like all of you um, who are watching um, because um, we rely on a lot of um, citizen science data to help understand horseshoe crab movement and survival throughout the entire U.S. East Coast. Um, and for those of you that don't know, there's this um, coastwide horseshoe crab tagging program that involves thousands of citizen scientists volunteers each spring. And um, this project entails um, citizen scientists partnering up with environmental agency um, biologists and researchers in terms of tagging horseshoe crabs during the spawning period. Um, and this is just a picture showing you the horseshoe crab tags that are inserted into um, the side of horseshoe crab um, shells. Um, each year, we tag around 40,000 horseshoe crabs across the U.S. East Coast. And um, I actually use this data to help estimate survival and migration between these different colored regions throughout the U.S. East Coast to help um, improve their management. And in Florida, there's actually a, their, your own unique horseshoe crab tagging program. Um, so this is just an image of the, the, the tagging website through the Florida, Florida Fishery and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, just showing you that if you see a tagged crab, you know how to report. Um, where it was found, um, its number, and et cetera, which I recommend you guys do if you stumble upon a tagged crab. Um, but if you're um, interested in becoming a citizen science volunteer in Florida, I actually have um, a few contacts you can email if you want to um, participate and go out um, during the spring and help tag horseshoe crabs um, in you know, in the fall and spring down in Florida, because it's, it's a pretty cool sight to see thousands of horseshoe crabs come up on the beach 
um, at night and tag horseshoe crabs. And this map here on the right um, shows you the current locations or, or counties where horseshoe crab programs are being run. But in this green, which is closer to you, I think in Palm Beach and Broward County, um, it's supposed to be um, a new tagging county um, in the coming uh, months and years. But um, I'm sure if you contacted um, these different um, volunteer coordinators on the bottom of, of this slide, you know, you could probably help start up some tagging locations um, that have previously not been um, conducted. Um, so anyways, I want you to um, try to tag horseshoe crabs if you can. Um, and with that, I'll take uh, any questions. Oops. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Justin. This was really informative. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, in the meantime, if anyone thinks of a question, go ahead and type it in there and we'll just kind of go through them all. Uh, TJ wants to know, how can you get involved in these sort of citizen science programs? Are there uh, age or skill requirements? So that's a good question, TJ. Um, so uh, I would recommend getting involved probably by emailing those people I just mentioned. Um, that's the best way to, to do that. Or you can even ask your local aquariums or education centers um, about these programs. Because oftentimes they're, they have personnel that are a part of these programs. Um, so yeah, I would say either you know, go to your local aquarium or marine education center, ask people that work there about it, but also email um, those people that I have on, on the slide. You can even look at the um, Florida Fish um, Conservation website as well for information about that too. And um, we have people of all ages participate in the program. Um, there's no skills needed, um, you know, as long as you, you know, have two hands that can help tag and record data, um, or even just, you know, help um, shout out, you know, different crabs, which, which ones are there, you know, males versus females, anything is, is good. And we have age groups from four years old all the way up to 90 years old participate in the program. So anybody and everybody can participate in that. Awesome. Um, do you think that uh, for, just to give you background, for Florida high school students, they need a certain amount of community service hours before they can graduate? Um, do you think that the citizen science, um, if they were to get involved, would that help meet those service hours, do you think? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's definitely a community service um, worthy um, um, feat. I think you can easily put this as hours um, mm -hmm. uh, for community service because it, it's, you know, helping multiple groups of people out. It's helping shorebird conservationists, horseshoe crab conservationists, um, researchers out. So it's really, you know, just you simply helping us tag is helping a lot of different groups better manage horseshoe crabs. Awesome. Um, do you have any recommendations for aspiring marine scientists on how to build up their resume and skill set? And what do you think is the most important skill for becoming a marine scientist? Oh, I could have a whole seminar on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, there is um, really no, like, there's a lot of different paths people can take to become a marine biologist. Um, each person's path is relatively unique. But in terms of the core um, skill set, I would recommend that you get, um, even before college, is, you know, volunteer um, in, in high school um, and college as much as possible. You know, you can become um, a volunteer in many research labs or in different programs like the Citizen Science Program, which come a long way and, and kind of introduce you into different um, fields to see what you like and don't like. So I would say try to get as much experience as possible um, because that really helps, you know, identify your interests. Um, but in terms of like um, courses, um, I know a lot of people don't like math, but um, it's becoming a very heavy part of, of the biological sciences. So I would definitely recommend taking as much uh, math classes as you can. Definitely reading and writing courses because a lot of our time is spent um, reading the literature um, and, and writing um, up our research results and getting grants. So writing is, an, is a key skill. Um, and then also, um, you know, even classes like communication classes are a big deal because a lot of um, scientists are asked to communicate their, their results in many different ways. So that's important. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think those are just like the, the three main kind of course curriculum skills on top of science courses um, that you should um, try to focus in on um, as well. And 
most important skill for becoming a marine scientist? I feel like, um, for one, you have to be passionate. Uh, because if you're not passionate, then you're not going to be interested in, in doing what you're doing. Um, but also just try to be um, persistent and detail oriented, you know, because even, a, you know, um, marine scientists aren't perfect. We fail, experiments fail. So just being persistent and, and being driven will go a long way to get you to where you need to be um, successful. Awesome. Thank you. And then the last one, um, unless anybody else has any other questions, feel free to type them in. But um, TJ says, I hear a lot about how horseshoe crabs are likely to help with major medical breakthroughs. Um, it, do you think this is true? Is it just because they are super old? What sort of applications do you think that could have? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think um, it's a mix of yes between all those questions. Um, one reason why um, we think that they have this ability to ward off infections from bacteria is because of how old they are. We think that simply because of being around on Earth for 450 million years, they've evolved this immune system to kind of combat um, these different um, virus or bacterial invasions. So, um, and that's um, partially why it's used in a lot of uh, medical research is because you know, it's used for to make sure everything's sterile, but there's also different compounds in their blood that are being used to test for cancer research, um, other types of uh, biomedical research that I think will be very valuable and will help with breakthroughs. And in fact, um, their vision, um, research on their vision has actually helped with um, a human vision advancement. And there was actually a Nobel Peace Prize one for uh, a, uh, you know, ophthalmologist working on, on vision and and stuff in horseshoe crabs. So yeah, there's a lot to be um, learned still from horseshoe crabs for sure. I, I have so many questions about the, studying their eyes to help human eyes because our yeah. eyes are not the same. Yeah, they're, right? they're not the same. So that when you look at their, their, so you can see in this picture, their yeah. silver eyes, their compound eyes. They actually yeah. have eyes. Um, if you include their tail as an eye, um, yep. but um, the two main compound eyes, they can actually tell um, shape within about six feet. So they can, like figures, cool. that's how they see other crabs when they come up close when they're about six feet, just say a six feet of distance. But um, their nerves are actually so big to their eyes that um, they, researchers use um, their nerves, their advantage to better understand how like cones and rods worked in their eyes to then understand how they worked in our eyes as well. So that's awesome. I have yeah, never so that's, that. they, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. So they literally cut um hole in a live crab behind their compound eye to access the nerve and while the crab was still like alive to yeah. to understand vision, which is pretty neat. Oh my gosh. So that's we have lots of hope to them. They're important to us. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this was awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to type it in the chat, but it seems like everyone's saying thank you so much. It was awesome. Um, thank you again, Justin, for giving us your time and presenting all about horseshoe crabs. Um, we are recording this and then we will edit it and post it to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for it. If you guys have any questions at all, don't hesitate to find us on Facebook. Uh, what's your Instagram, Twitter, all those social media things, or you could always email us at meek, M-E-E-C, at nova.edu. So thank you again, Justin. Um, we will be back next week at 1 p.m. with, oh, I don't know what it is. Oh, yes, I do. Hold on. So sorry. I was somewhat. <laughs> um, next week, we're going to be talking with Hannah Blair, who uses acoust active acoustics or sonar to study fish, crustaceans, and other zooplankton in the open ocean. Um, so tune in next week and thank you again. Everyone have a great weekend. Thanks guys. And if you guys want to email me for any more questions, feel free. Yes. yes. Uh, what is your email address? Um, it's, I can type it in. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. There we go. I think, yep. All right. Cool. Awesome. So justin.bop at stonybrook.edu. Oh, yep. that wasn't it. Don't, don't read that question. That was my fault. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. I was trying to type it to the a copy and type it to all the panelists. Yeah, you're good. <laughs>
I was doing an in-service training before. Yay. Uh, there we go. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys. Everyone stay safe and we will hopefully see you guys next week.